<laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not great with notation. I sometimes have trouble making up a good notation. But I could do better than that. I'd use a capital fancy omega or something. I think I did in class. Yeah. Okay. Just one day or two, yeah, we did it differently. You what? One or two different days we you yeah. used a different Yeah. But not all. So anyhow, here I'm gonna just go with the books notation. But I've got a note. Theta prime is omega, but that's not the k squared of k over m omega. Okay? You don't want to confuse the two, which is really easy when you have an ambiguous notation that I don't like. <laughs> so I've got to really warn you about that. You've got to understand which omega you're talking about. You can't use this omega when you're talking about this omega because they don't even have the same units. Okay? Um, Actually, they do, which is even worse. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was hoping they didn't have the same units, but milliseconds thought that, oh, yeah, they do. Okay, well, they're both in radians per second. So if all you're doing is memorizing formulas, you're going to mix them up. You've got to understand where everything comes from. So the solution is not A cosine omega t plus phi with omega really have a knot there. I'm just busy dragging things out of people. But as often happens. I wrote something down carelessly. I was thinking it was not this, it's going to be that, but then after I wrote the knot down I switched the order of the things I was doing. It happens. Age. Okay, anyhow. So the solution is a cosine omega t plus phi. Okay? Now your book uses a big old fat theta instead of A. I'm going to stay with A. There are too many ambiguous symbols. Okay? Uh, and anybody wants to disagree with me, I agree with them. <laughs> okay? Uh, omega squared of k over i. But the square root of k over i is not the omega, that's theta prime. There's where the knot belonged. I had an extraneous knot there. Okay? Knots in my head or something. Frequency uh, versus velocity. Again? Frequency versus velocity. Angular frequency. Yeah, velocity. angular frequency angular versus velocity. angular velocity. Okay? And on your reference circle, angular frequency is the number of radians per second as you go along around the reference circle. The simple harmonic oscillator is modeled by a projection of that point. Okay? And you still project it like onto the x-axis. You could project it onto the y-axis. That would be project it onto any line through the origin. It's going to be fine. Okay? But you project usually onto the x-axis. But now that projection onto the x-axis is not the actual motion of the oscillator. If you're talking about something that's an angular oscillator, that projection onto x just represents the function. It represents this function wherever it is, okay? But now you're not representing something that's actually moving along an x-axis. It's just you're representing theta. Um, so you can actually think of the circle around which this is rotating and just the angular position, but no, you don't want to think about that. Forget what I just said. Uh, you want to think of the projection and you want to think through why that is. Now, with what we measure specifically, Okay. Now I did, didn't remember I had, so I was going to stick with A. Well, no. I'm going to go theta max instead of a big, bold theta, which is kind of hard to write and distinguish from your regular theta. You're doing it by hand, which you should be, in my opinion. Anybody think disagrees with me on that as well? <laughs> okay. Thank you.
I say that with some humility. Okay, maximum thing, right? I'm gonna use that. Okay, so at 0.7 radians, we did a measurement. We concluded that your net torque was negative K theta, and that's negative 10,000 dynes times 10 centimeters, which is 100,000 dynes. I put my comma in the wrong place when I corrected this thing, so I got to correct it again. 100,000 dyne centimeters, 10,000 dynes at 10 centimeters, moment arm times force, and the force is perpendicular to the moment arm. Okay? So K is going to be that. Now torque divided by theta. So here's our net torque. That was at, the estimate I used here was 0.7 radians. And that's plus or minus a couple of tenths. I didn't measure it. We're just trying to get a ballpark, and you understand it can be measured because you've measured those things in life. Okay? K is 10,000 dime centimeters over 0.7 radians, which is then, fortunately I have a little space between the 14 and the 1,000, 140,000 dime centimeters per radian. And now we're going to come back to SI units. It's going to be 0.014 meter newtons per radian. Now let's just review quickly what a dime means. It's a of a meter? I mean, I mean, uh, the newton. Well, okay. A dime is what you get when you multiply a gram by a centimeter per second squared. Because a dime is a unit of force. It's mass times acceleration. Mass in grams, okay? And acceleration in centimeters per second squared. Well, there are a thousand grams in a kilogram. So if you want to get from dynes to newtons, okay, the factor is a thousand for the gram going to the kilogram, okay, and a hundred for the centimeter, so it's a hundred thousand. It takes a hundred thousand dynes to give you a newton, okay? So a hundred thousand dynes to give you a newton, so you'd have, what, 1.4 newton centimeters per radian, okay? Because, you know, the centimeter here is just the centimeter in the acceleration, the centimeter per second squared. It's not this centimeter. Now, you still need another factor of 100 for that centimeter to go to a meter, right? Okay, well, that means it takes... You know, this is still a newton centimeter per radian. It's still only one one hundredth of a meter newton per radian. So you got to go a hundredth of that 1.4, which gives you the 0.014. That's just common sense on the units. And if you can think them through like that rather than memorizing conversion formulas, I mean, between dynes and um, dyne centimeters, or dynes and ergs, which is joules, has the same units, you got a 10 to the 5th and a 10 to the 7th, okay? 10 to the 5th of these make one of these, and 10 to the 7th of the, one of these makes one of these, so move a decimal over seven places. Well, that's a thoughtless way of doing it, but you should know the thoughtless way as well as the way to think it through, so you can reconcile them if you do something stupid like I did, okay? forgetting to write down the 10 centimeters there, which is just as bad as anything I see you guys do. Oh, okay. So, now we have this. Omega is this square root of K over I. Set of square root of K over M. It just, yeah, right there it is. Okay, your omega has to be square root of K over I. For the same reason, this one has to be square root of K over M. Okay? Actually, it is square root of K over M. We just call it omega, right? And this is square root of k over i. We just call it omega 2. So we can be confused between angular frequency and angular velocity. Okay. Um, but it, it's inherently confusing. I don't have a perfect solution to that. Um, 
Okay. So there's your omega, 0.36 radians per second. Now at 0.36 radians per second, how long is it going to take you to go through a complete cycle? Well, it takes you about three seconds to go through a radian, right? Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. A little out. less than three seconds, because three times 0.36 is a little more than once, 1.08. Okay? And then if you want to go through two pi radians, well, that's about six more. So it should take about six times three seconds to go around the circle at 0.3 radians, which is about that much per second. Okay? So you just think of the circle, 0.36 radians, 0.72, 1.08, right? 1.44, and so forth. I'm not going to say the rest of them because I'll screw something up. That much I think is right. Um, okay? It's going to take you like ballpark 18 seconds. Counting this thing, I counted half a cycle in 1,008. That would be 16 seconds, right? For a cycle? I just did half a cycle. So my estimate was 16 seconds based on what I measured and our calculation of the moment of inertia, just moment of inertia of each magnet. And of course, I kind of lumped them. They got four of them about this far. And and then the 112 ml squared, we know the mass of the beam and stuff like that. We just added them up. Uh, and I think that's on the next board. Actually, it's right here, and you probably can't see that on the... But we got 0.1 kilogram meter squared for the moment of inertia. That's where this came from. Okay? We've done moment of inertia calculations. They're pretty simple if you understand it. Totally impossible if you don't. So hopefully you do. Um, okay. So we got that. We got pretty good agreement, like we're only off by maybe 10%. Just using rough estimates and counting by 1,001. I didn't count by stopwatch. You see, Tom just brought me these real neat stopwatches, and I laid them over there. We could use a stopwatch. It would be a lot better, yeah. Or we could hook this thing up to the Vernier interface, and we could see how long it takes the cycle to occur, right? So maybe it's going to be a little closer. Maybe it's not going to be as close. I don't know if I counted fast or slow. Okay? I think it's fairly close. Uh, so that's really pretty good agreement between what we can observe right in front of our faces and figure out using what we've done. Right? Yeah. Okay? And of course, we did labs with this and didn't get totally analyzed, or this would be a lot clearer. Of course, you know, there's life and there's time and stuff, and you guys are putting some time into this course. Uh, hopefully enough. Make sense? We do try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're trying. Okay, make sense? Yeah. Okay, hopefully it'll make more sense when you see this 46-minute video. Yeah.